Would you just lift your hands? Father, we come today as a sign of surrender. We lift our hands to remove ourselves from what we've been trying to fix, but it's beyond our reach, capacity, and grasp. We thank you, God, that we don't have to depend on ourselves, but God, our hope for life is anchored in you. Because, God, of your finished work on Calvary's cross, not do we have hope for eternal life, but we have heavenly help while we're still here on earth. And so we thank you for salvation, for the Holy Ghost that now lives on the inside of us, for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, for your church, which is a sanctuary where the righteous can run in and find safety. We thank you, God, for brothers and sisters in faith that can pray for us when we're too weak to pray for ourselves. We thank you, God, for all that you have provided us in the kingdom for us to live out the full intent of your, of your desire and design for our lives. Therefore, God, we've come into this house, we've gathered in your name to worship you. We've come to this place to hear from you. And God, we recognize that the adversary wars against those who seek your face. And so, God, we put them under our feet right now and we claim the victory. We, we believe, God, that your word will go forth, and when it goes forth, it will not return void, but it will set the captive free and set us right. Father, have your way. We intercede right now for loved ones who are ailing. We intercede right now for individuals who are falling back into unhealthy cycles. We intercede right now for this nation as it teeters on the brink of destruction and for this world that continues to be uh, ravaged by war and rumors of war. God, we need you. And we can't make it without you. And so, Father, we thank you right now that we find safety in you. Now, God, have your way. Pour out your spirit on all flesh. And have you choose to move, we'll be careful to give you the credit. We'll say that Jesus did it. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. And all God's children said amen, amen, and thank God. Amen. On the way to your seat, tell somebody, pastor's going to preach about windows and streams. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your cooperation. You may take your seats. Amen. Help me thank God for our young adult group. I don't know who they are today. Huh? Who y'all? Them. Thank God for them. It's evidence. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We're continuing today in the series of messages we began at the beginning of this month under the general heading, Manager on Duty. And for that purpose, I want to direct your attention to the screen so you can see uh, a little tidbit from uh, one of the families in our congregation. Let's roll. I am Keo Odin Tyson. I am Lincoln Tyson. We, we are, are the Tyson, Tyson family. family. We'll be married 12 years on Saturday. Um, we have a son who's 10 years old. Um, and then we have uh, two sons from a blended family, Biles. Colin and Kevin. I own a government uh, consulting firm when we do project management for the government. Entrepreneurship is definitely a, a faith walk. Um, when, you're, when you make that decision, you're like, Lord, it's just you and me <laughs> because there's, there's really no floor. So you really have to rely on your faith. Having God in, into the equation is huge um, because the biggest thing I think is people tend to want to start a business because other people have a business. That's not a good reason to start a business. You, you really need to do your research and you, you need to be vested. I, I never set out to be uh, an entrepreneur. I went to law school and was following a pretty linear path and uh, went to law firms after law school. And just at a point in time, I realized that I could do it and I wanted to do it. So it was more a situation where I just decided to take the leap after realizing I didn't want to be in firms anymore. You want to step out on faith. You want to have God be a part of your decision making. I just realized that corporate America um, were, were making large profits off the work that I was doing and the projects that I was managing. So I just felt as though um, if I'm doing the same work day in and day out, um, why not do it for myself? and then you know, try to uh, build something that I could help provide for other people, help them feed their families and give them a more equitable stake in the work that we do um, and not just be another number going to work every day. Um, it has helped me um, be able to give back. I was <clears throat> blessed to have um, gotten with Reverend Kendra and learning about this magnificent food drive that was developing. And so I just figured 
um, if we could do one in Prince George's County and then TPM Group could sponsor one of those food drives for one week. <laughs> I had no idea that it was gonna end up being over three years that we were gonna be doing it, but it's been a, it's been a huge blessing. When I think about our sort of journey as tithers and continuing to tithe as entrepreneurs, um, I'm led to the scripture in uh, the third chapter of Malachi. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And we have definitely experienced that um, where situations came along that should have otherwise absolutely taken us out. We should not be where we are. And our resources should have been totally wiped out. Um, but God was faithful because we were faithful. And as a result, not only did he sustain us, I mean, not a mortgage payment missed, not a car payment missed, uh, not a tuition payment missed, um, but we've actually prospered and we're in a better place than we were before those challenges. And I, and I believe, and I, I think we both believe it's because we've been faithful uh, as tithers. Amen. Is the Tyson family here? Amen. Y'all stand up. Amen. Lincoln and Keo. They're real people. I want you to know we, they're not plants. They're not actors. Amen. <laughs> Grateful to God for their witness and for their faithfulness. And I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, to talk about uh, streams and windows because it hit me that as we talk about the tithe, you heard they're clear about the fact that the tithe is not just about God opening the window. It's also about him rebuking the devourer. It hit me that oftentimes we're looking at a static 100%. So I give the first 10% to God. And then we talked last week about how we need to manage the 90, right? But, but it's possible to increase the 100%. God, God says, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you down blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. But he never said, I couldn't have more than one window. <laughs> throw, throw, throw that slide up. Uh, I want to talk about windows and streams. I got this, this image of uh, this building in Sioux Falls uh, where the dam broke and the water came rushing and the water was literally rushing in and out of the building. As, as long as there was wall, there could be no water. But where there was window, water was able to come in and go out, right? May I suggest that as we talk about trying to be good managers, we may want to consider adding some windows. Because it's called currency for a reason. It flows in, and if you're not careful, it'll flow right back out. But, but I, I want to challenge us to consider learning how, first of all, to keep it in, good, 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 good spending habits, and then learning how to add more windows so more can come in. So let me start off right where we left off last week with, with how we spend. So a uh, number of us went to uh, Egypt and Dubai. I see some of y'all out there. Amen. We had a good time. Had a good time. And, at, and Dubai is like nothing I've ever seen. It's like Vegas on steroids without all the sketch. Um, so, so we're there, and they were telling us about this, this hotel, uh, the Burj Al Arab uh, Jerma, Jer, Jer, Jermara. And um, it's supposed to be a seven-star hotel. That's what I said. So, so, they, so to, in order to be a seven-star, they try to take everything to the next level, including the fact that they have a policy, listen to this, that if you drive to the hotel, you cannot drive in a car that has a license plate with more than three digits on the plate. Because... In, in Dubai, the concept is that the, the less digits you have, the more powerful, the more affluent. And so they can't have no four-digit people rolling up. <laughs> I mean, heaven forbid, right? So literally, if you don't have a three-digit license plate, they will send a Bentley to get you, but you're not rolling up 
I don't care what you're rolling in. You're not rolling up like that. I heard that. You know what I said to myself? These people have run out of things to spend money on. That, I mean, at the, if you, because they're spending millions of dollars to get a license plate with three digits. Do, do you know how arbitrary and capricious that is? And yet, the same thing we do because of a designer name. It used to be when you spent something, spent money on something, it was because of the quality of it, the materials. It was made of gold or silver. They done figured it out. I can just put my name on a T-shirt, and you will pay $150 for a T-shirt. Somebody said, I thought we were done with this last week, Pastor. Nope, I got more. <laughs> what I'm trying to see, what I'm trying to get you to see is that when we make decisions like that, we are, we are wasting our margin. Let the church sound margin. Now, this is really important. That, that God has sent us resources, and there is a, a, a level that we have to spend, you know, on, on housing and, and food and and, and clothing, that's the basics. Everything else is the margin that we get to choose what we do with. And I want to suggest that rather than giving our margin to other people, we should invest our margin in ourselves by developing various streams of income. I mean, it's interesting to me. No, 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 it's too late. It's too late. <laughs> no shame clapping here. If you didn't get it the first time, don't get on late. <laughs> Bandwagon applause. What, what I'm trying to see, what get you to see is, literally, you, when, when God says to Moses, what's in your hand? He's saying, you already have that which you need to do what, that which I called you to do. So if I've called you to prosper, that means that there's something that you can do with what I've already given you. So everybody shout margin. That means there's something already in my possession that I can make a different decision about that provides me resources that will then lead to a different outcome. So, so I want to suggest, and, and I'm so glad I, I forgot to shout you out. Sister Denise, it wasn't just the grandparents. I ain't saying nothing about the parents. But Sister Denise uh, O'Connor, she's new grandmother again, too. But, but Reverend Loxley has put together uh, our faith and finance uh, course. In fact, uh, we already are underway for this semester, but we're going to be signing up for a new semester. And I want to encourage you today to sign up. We're going to do a, he's going to be doing a special called Streams. He has uh, a special course. He talks about seven streams of income that all of us can have. Do I have your attention now? So you can just text uh, the word streams to 240-201-3300, I'll wait, 201-3300. And, and the reason I want you to do this is because we keep praying the same prayers, but not using new strategy. And what I've discovered in my own walk is if I couple my prayer life with God's strategy, I tend to work at things to work out a whole lot better. So, so, so here's what you need to understand. I said this last week, money does not come with directions. It does not come with instruction, which means in your library, you should have a money section. I've been studying money since I was a child because I like it. <laughs> I've been studying business I, I've, because I understand that like everything else, effort and energy and intentionality are required for anything that I expect to have a return on. If I expect a return on my education, I need to study. If I expect a return on my marriage, I need to invest in it. I need to invest in the outcomes of my financial life. And so let, let me just walk through some streams real quick, just, just if you don't mind. So first of all, I want to suggest to you that, that you ought to have uh, one stream called wages. You ought to have a, a gig, a job, a, a steady check. I'm a big believer in a steady check because I like to eat every day. <laughs> every day. I just call me crazy. Don't judge me. And, and, then, and then, you know, many of us have jobs where you also have a 401k. 
And, and then God has been so good that he's allowed your employer to even provide a matching amount in your 401k. And I believe your first margin move ought to be maxing out the match. Every time you don't max out, that's $2 you've lost. Not one, but two. Are you with me? So, so, so I want you to, to consider those two things. Then I want you to be a homeowner. When, when I first started working at Reed Temple in 1999, when I came as a youth minister, I had one goal in mind, and that was to be a homeowner. I was 24, 25. And here was my rationale, that the earth is huge, and, and I ought to own something on it. I mean, it, it's, it was offensive for me to think about the idea that I would occupy the, the planet for however long God would give me and not own an inch of it. So, so, so I, I purposed, and, and those of you who've been around me know the story. I, I lived with Aunt Pam for six months. I slept on her couch. Amen. I remember when Uncle Eduardo came through the door. I tried to look at him, but he was a cop, so it didn't work like I wanted. Anyway, um, I saved up and I bought my first condo. And, and, and that condo almost tripled in value. So, so for not doing anything but what I was doing when I was renting, now there's money coming in the window. I'm either going to pay my note or I'm going to pay your note. That's called rent. Right? And, and, and so while I'm living, I'm not doing anything. My, my house is out there hustling. I don't know how it's on the corner. I don't know what it's doing, but it's, it's making money. It's selling dimes and nicks. I don't know what's going on, but, but the house is a baller. The house is working, right? right. Let, let, me, let me give you another strategy for, uh, stream, for, for another stream. Let me see all my singles in the house. If you're single, raise your hand. Raise your hand, look around. Raise your hand, look around. <laughs> trying to bless somebody. <laughs> I'm trying to bless somebody. See, no cover charge for this. I'm, <laughs> look around, look around. Make a friend, make a friend. Let's look around. All right. Um, Singles, you have built in wealth into your status because it's just you. It's just you. First of all, that means you don't have to negotiate with anybody about financial decisions. Those are married people clapping right there. <laughs> you you got to know your audience. Married folks is like, ain't nothing but the truth. <laughs> right? But that also means that you can pick your level of living. It's just you. It's just you, right? So you can make decisions that, that allow you the freedom to advance your financial state because it's just you, right? You can get a roommate. I can't get no roommate. You can't get no income. So, I didn't say you get a roommate forever. But if it's tight and you got an empty bedroom, there's a closed window in your house. Well, I'm, I'm grown. Pride goes before the fall. I was grown when I slept on my aunt's couch. But because I slept on her couch as a grown man, my money grew when I got my condo. Here's my challenge. I want to lose weight. I just don't want to change my diet or workout. That's my only problem. And, and no matter what book I read, what class I go to, 
they keep coming back to the two same things. See, we keep looking for a silver bullet that says, I want to increase without having to sacrifice. Tell your neighbor it doesn't work like that. All right. So, so singles, understand that God has put you in a great position to be able to make moves that will allow money to move through your window. All my married folk. Now, let me help y'all a couple things. Let me go back to the singles one more time. Uh, there's this crazy list on the internet about all the places a guy shouldn't take you for your first date. Like, y'all keep figuring out ways to steal defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> right? Who cares if he takes you to Cheesecake Factory? <laughs> Is he saved? Does he have a job? Does he do his nouns and verbs at any point agree? I mean, these are the things. I can do bad by myself. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Point taken. Um, well, he got, I'm making money. Well, okay, so, okay, so you make $100,000. Does he have to make $100,000? What if he makes $50,000? Well, let me do it this way. Would you refuse a $50,000 raise? Wait, and cut your housing expense. So I'm not telling any single, please hear what I'm saying. I'm not telling any single to get married for money because you will be miserable if you marry for money. But I do want to point out, it's just as easy to marry somebody with money as somebody broke. Not saying you should marry for money, but it should be somewhere on the list. <laughs> you don't have to make what I make, but you have to make. <laughs> You're going to make something. I ain't walking out of here. You sitting over there talking about, bring me some Popeyes. The devil is a liar. <laughs> go to Popeyes and fry some chicken, do something. All right. All right, back to my married people. Sorry. Just wanted to bless the singles. All right. Married folks, so, so you have a bunch of advantages, right? So uh, there's two incomes. That's another stream. In fact, that's another 401K for, for some of y'all. So that's another stream. Plus, we're counting housing expense, right? Because we're financially together. Number one reason people get divorced is what? So that's not true. It's not money. It's different values about money. When we say people get divorced about money, we make it sound like th that there is no money. It's not a lack of money. It's a lack of agreement about money. That's why you want to focus your faith on the way God does it because he brings us into agreement. It's not my way. It's not your way. It's God's way. Preach, Pastor. I'm doing the best I can. So, so, so there's some benefits. And then, and then once we have some, some money coming in and we learn how to get our margin together, now we can invest and in reach real estate investment trust and stocks. We, we, we can buy a rental property. So what you do is you get your first house, and then once you get your money right, then you keep, keep, keep that house, and then you get another house, and then rent out what? first house, right? You, you can consult. So you work for the government, you are expert in something, right? So you can consult, you, you can write a book, you can, you can speak, you can do art. You can, now I'm going to say this one, but I got to qualify. You can be a clothed influencer,
I'm just waiting for it to hit. Yes, if you disrobe yourself, you will get more followers. But self-exploitation is still exploitation. It got awkward there, didn't it? Um, and then, of course, you can, you can own a, a for, more formal business. We'll talk about that more in just a second. So, so let's, let's get into another passage. 2 Kings 4, beginning in verse 8. 2 Kings 4 and 8. Throw up on the screen if you can. All right, let's read together. One day Elisha was passing through Shunem where a wealthy woman lived to urge him to have a meal. So whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for a meal. She said to her husband, look, I am sure that this man who regularly passes our way is a holy man of God. Let us make a small roof chamber with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, a lamp so that he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when he came there, he went up to the chamber and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite woman. When he called her, she stood before him. He said to him, say to her, since you have taken all this trouble for us, what may be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She answered, I live among my own people. I love this passage for a number of reasons. First of all, we don't get her name, but we get a real good picture of who she is. The Bible refers to her as a wealthy woman. Now, she's married, but it refers to her as a wealthy woman. And the Bible says as Elijah the prophet would happen by uh, her neighborhood, she would invite him in to eat. And, and she said to her husband, I'm sure this is a holy man of God, and we ought to make a space, a place for him. We ought to build him a special room and give him a, in that room a lamp and a, and a table and a bed. So whenever he comes by, he has a place to stay. Now, I love this for several reasons. First of all, we recognize how, how her wealth has allowed her to have influence beyond tradition. So, so one of the reasons you ought to be a good steward is steward, good stewardship, wealth, allows you to in some ways bypass the discrimination and oppression that's built into the system. America's an interesting place. It's all about the white and the black until the green shows up. And so this sister has influence, and notice now how she operates. She, she says to herself, she takes it upon herself, watch this, to say, I want to bless this man of God. So, so from a power perspective, I want you to notice how she operates in financial freedom. First of all, she has power beyond what women normally would have during that day because of her financial means. Now, now watch this. Not, not only does she have power, but then secondarily, she has security. I like this. Bible says after they start staying there, uh, Elisha and Gehazi, the Bible says uh, that they come and ask her, what can we do for you, right? Because you've been so good to us. Can we speak a word on, behalf, uh, on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? I love her response. I live among my own people. Can I translate that? I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. That, that when you have your house in order, it gives you a sense of security. Right? That, that, that there is an inverse relationship between stress and options. When you don't have any options, your stress goes up. But, but when you're good, you're good. So, so watch this. She says, I'm good. We're, I live among my own people. I got this. Everything's going well. And, and I love it because she says to her husband, listen, I want us to build a, a room for him. I, I want us to make room for this man of God. And, and it's just a, it's a decision because it's an option. She doesn't say, uh, I'd like to, but we don't have the ability to. She's already in position to. Does anybody remember when you didn't have options? When you got to take whatever folk give you because you don't have options? I, I, I told y'all uh, 
when, when we were uh, doing TKN last year, uh, we were, you know, talking to some sponsors. You know, some folk act real funny about money, even if it ain't their money. So we were talking to this company about, you know, them coming along as a partner, as a sponsor, and they were just doing the most. I mean, it was real kind of, you know, bow down. And I just had to kind of, you know, reset the conversation. Let them know, hey, listen, this is just a courtesy call. We wanted to provide you an option to come alongside of us and to possibly partner with us uh, in a synergy that aligns with both of our missions. But understand, this is going to happen in grand fashion, whether you come forward or not. It's great to have options. And, and folk treat you different when they know they're not the only option that you have. So, so, so watch this. She's in a position of power, she's, she's secure, and she operates in generosity. And I want you to underline this term, open-ended generosity. She doesn't say, let's build a roof, a, a, a house on the roof for the man of God so that we can be blessed, so we can get a bigger house, so we can get something. She did it because she felt it was a way to honor God. Can I tell you, as we've been talking throughout this month about being a manager on duty, I don't want you to get it twisted. I'm not up here trying to give you kingdom principles so you can manipulate God so you can get stuff. My giving to God is always a response because God has already given to me. Period. Full stop. That, that she gives, she desires to be generous simply because she's already been blessed. Now, now, when you were down here and now you're up here and it doesn't change the way you give, it doesn't say something about the money, it says something about you. Let, let me give the next slide. 2 Kings, 2 Kings 4, 14. Let's read he said, what then may be done for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son. Let's read together. She has no son and her husband is old. That's, <laughs> you know, sometimes the Bible, it'll throw all kinds of shade. If you read it too fast, you'll miss it. <laughs> he said, what then may be done for her? Because remember, she said, I'm good, right? So she basically didn't even make a request. So they still would, they refuse because she's been open and generous. They want to be open and generous. So she didn't ask for anything. Now they're trying to figure out a way to bless her. What, what, what then may be done for her? He's the answer. Well, she has no son and her husband is old. It's just cold blooded, man. I had to put my man out there like that. Uh, he said, call her. When he called her, she stood at the door. He said, at this season, in due time, you shall embrace a son. She replied, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not deceive your servant. The woman conceived and bore a son at season in due time, as Elisha had declared to her. When the child was older, he went out uh, one day with his fathers among the reapers. So, so Bible says that, that he gives her a blank check. She refuses to fill it in. And what I love about it is he then offers her something that money can't buy. You know, she's not been able to, to have a son, and you know her husband is old. Right? <laughs> and... And, and I want you to see this. I want you to see this. And when he brings it to her, her response is not hallelujah, make a praise lap. She says, oh, no man of God. Do not. In other words, don't, don't play with me on this. this. This is too close. And can I just say this? There's some stuff we stop praying for because we don't want to deal with, the, with this thing of disappointment. I want to challenge somebody right now to pray again, to believe again, to risk again. Because I'd rather risk the disappointment than miss the blessing that's tied to my faith. Y'all not hearing me. 
that if I would simply be bold enough to believe, it's no guarantee, but if I don't believe, I'm guaranteed not to get more than what God has already given me. But if I choose to step out on faith, I then open up the window that gives him the opportunity to do what he has declared and desired and destined for my life. And I need to know, is there anybody here that is a witness that sometimes God is not on the express, but he takes the local. Sometimes he takes his good, sweet time and fulfilling his word. He takes the scenic route. When you're trying to figure out what is the holdup and what is going on, it seems like we're going in the wrong direction. But can I tell you like my granddaddy, he may not come when you want him, but he's still an on-time God. Yes, he is. Tell three people, believe again, believe again, believe again. This ain't no new prayer request. This is an unopened prayer request that's been sitting on the shelf of your spirit for the last year and a half. Because you told yourself it was going to happen, it would be happening by now. The devil is a liar. God works in his own time and for his own purpose, and you simply have to agree. Listen, it's hard to fall off the floor. If it doesn't happen, you're going to be right where you are right now. There's only one way to go, and that's up. No, no, man of God, don't, don't, don't play with me on this. The Bible says in due season she had a son, and now the son has grown up, and he's out with the father in the field with the reapers. Now, now that's important because that suggests that this family owned a business, right? That they're business owners, and, and, and I want you to see this uh, because there are certain things, there are some things that come with being business owners. Now, I, I appreciate the wisdom that Brother Lincoln shared in the video. Because he said, listen, some people go into business because of the romance of owning a business. He said, ain't no reason to go in business. L listen, uh, you know, a lot of people, I want to open up a restaurant. Are you crazy? That's about one of the hardest businesses. You know how much exposure you have, how many variables you have to manage? You have staff, the cost of food, the availability of food, the rent that may go up. There's so many. Nah. If you want to go into a business, you want to go into a business that you feel like you have some strategic advantage in and that you are passionate about so much so that you would do it even if you didn't get paid. All right. But, and because there's and there's some intangible benefits when you make that decision, like like the joy of ownership is nothing like working for you. I noticed he struck a chord in the video when he said, I looked at what I was doing and how much money I was generating for somebody else, and I just made the decision, if I'm going to get up every day and put forth my best effort, I want to do it for myself. I want to work. There's a sense of, of pride of ownership that is not ungodly when you begin to strike out on your own. There are some tax benefits that if the same income, and I want to say this very clearly, and don't be too aggressive with your tax planning. Because I have a policy against jail. I don't want to go. <laughs> now, be careful because if you're not careful, you'll start watching stuff on the internet. And, well, you can claim this and you can claim that. And you can claim until they come and, and audit it. All right. But, but when you set, set, set yourself a visit, it's not just the income that's coming in that day. You've got to have a larger view. Now you have something other than some cars and clothes to leave to your kids. You have a legacy. It's going to require some discipline because now it's not a steady check. You have to get up in the morning every day and work for yourself. If that's not you, now you got to be honest about yourself. If you're not the kind of person who's self-motivated, keep your job. Get you some rental properties. <laughs> right? If you're a person that can't handle risk, I love uh, Sister Keo's testimony. She said, listen, uh, everybody talks about the windows that he'll pour out the blessing, but our favorite part is that he'll rebuke the devourer, that your business, every business is cyclical. There's going to be ups and downs. You got to have some risk tolerance, and you got to be aligned with God so that you know that when it's a down cycle, God is still going to rebuke the devourer, so I'll go down, but I don't go all the way down. And hear what I'm about to say, church. 
And if never before you considered owning a business, you need to own one, to consider owning one now for the next uh, thing on the list, AI. Artificial intelligence, about to put a whole lot of folk out of work. Did you hear me? Uh, the, the, the staff knows I have become an artificial intelligence aficionado. Because like the internet, it's as smart as you are. It, it's not just, you know, can you, can you craft me a letter? No, this thing can provide for you detailed steps in whatever it is you're trying to do. And that's why you ought to start developing something now so that if five, five months from now they decide to downsize your department, you're not trying to figure out on five months in a day what you're going to do. You need to start figuring out now another revenue stream because you never know. I'm trying to help somebody. Well, one of those areas that, that AI cannot replace is the service industry. I want you to do this. When we leave church today, I want you to look around at that parking lot and think about what if you had a detailing business? You can be spending just on what they rolled up in here today with. <laughs> right? But the problem is oftentimes we mistake our mystique with the business. So there's a lot of great businesses that aren't sexy. Uh, Bre uh, Reverend O'Connor and Sister Denise, they own a laundromat. No claps, no claps on a laundromat. I went to school, they did too. And they had sense enough to realize everybody needs to have their stuff washed. When, when stuff was shutting down during COVID, they were increasing capacity, right? And, and now they have a laundry delivery service. Are you hearing me? See, the great part about a business is it gives you a chip. It, it gives you, so when I go fishing, I don't just bring one rod and one hook. I bring different bait. I bring different tackle because I never know what's going what's, what's going to catch. I was going to say what's going to hit, but that's language that'll trigger some of y'all. What, what, what I'm saying is, I know your people. <laughs> what I'm saying is, once you start businesses, you never know. Okay, let me give you a real quick example. So years ago, uh, we purchased the uh, Center Park. But Brother Carl was instrumental in helping us uh, purchase Center Park. Now, we were purchasing it originally to do what we ended up doing here, which is to take an office building, build a sanctuary next to it, and make it our church. But as we got into the detail, it turned out we couldn't park the way we needed to park on the lot. But while we were looking at it, the, the, the USFDA awarded a 10-year, $24 million lease to the property. So now I can no longer build a church, but now we had an income opportunity. So I'm going to go, we about to buy that. You're supposed to be a church. Exactly. And we try not to have to fund everything out the plate. We need to buy that. Now, let me show you how business allows you to do stuff you didn't anticipate. So we were just trying to get it for revenue stream, right? But because of the value of the contract, not only was there a $24 million for 10 years, but also there was another $10 million uh, add-on where, where we had to renovate for the FDA. So the FDA paid to renovate our building. I'm still not happy, okay. So because they renovate our building, now our building is worth more than it was when we bought it. Okay, I'm going to try it over here. So because the building is now worth more than we bought it, and we didn't know when we bought it that a couple years later the bishop would say, hey, read north, y'all are going to become a separate church called Kingdom Fellowship. Now, normally, when you become a new entity, banks want to see two years of financial statements and performance before they will give you a dime. But because we bought a building that had increased in value... 
The first day I became pastor, the first job I had was to sign our construction loan that was secured by the building that the FDA had us renovate on their dime and based on Tell somebody, tell them, open the window, open the window. There's some, there's some stream that's trying to get in. There's a stream that's... You, what I'm trying to get you to see is once you stop living to work, once you pick your head up and realize, I mean, you are in the richest country in the world. You are in one of the wealthiest areas in the richest country in the world. You are in one of the most secure areas of the wealthiest area of the richest country in the world because this D.C. area is not affected as other areas are when recession hits. More than anybody else in the nation, you have the opportunity to open the window. So if the window is not open and stuff's not coming in, don't blame God. Don't blame the man. There's a mirror somewhere in your house. Can, can I just give you some tips for business real fast? So, so. So again, you want to get into a business that's profitable, not just something that you have a passion for. There's a difference between a business and a hobby. That, that you want to get into business with people of character. If, I don't, if you don't hear nothing else I say. And, and, and you, want, you want to count the cost. There's so many opportunities. Listen, listen. If you, if you just decided, you know what, I like pets, I'm going to start boarding pets. Do you know what people will pay you to take care of Rusty? <laughs> and don't fool around and get a grooming license in addition to boarding. You ain't got nothing to do all day in here, but watch Rusty. You might as well go ahead and, and wash him and get paid for that too. I'm sorry, that's not sexy. You want to be in a corner office, broke. <laughs> well, let me get y'all out of here. So, so the woman has the child. Child's out with the father in the field. Notice now, the woman, even though she's the woman that's called wealthy, she always checks in. She checked, she checked in with the husband. She didn't just build it because, you know, I make money. She didn't feel the need to emasculate him. And he didn't say no trying to control her. I told you it's not the availability of money, it's, it's the value. So, so they have the child, child's out with the father. Bible says the child says, my head, my head, and, and falls down. And, and they bring him back, they rush him back to the mother. And uh, she sends for Elisha. And, cause, you know, and I love it because they put the boy's body in the room they made for him. See, when you take care of God, when you make God a priority, then God has a place to bless your house. Preach, Pastor. I feel like preaching right now. Listen, what I'm trying to get you to see is, is Elijah comes and, and he lays on the child and breathes on the child and the child comes back to life. And that's normally where we stop the story. But if you read chapter 8 of 2 Kings, you'll discover that they come to the woman, the woman uh, from Shunem and they say, listen, get you and your family and y'all get out of here because a seven-year famine is coming. See, because she had prioritized God, she got inside information. We call that discernment. So, so watch this. They leave for seven years, and after the famine is over, they come back and watch this real close. When they come back, people have taken over their house. They've taken over their land. And because she's gone for seven years, the influence she used to have, she doesn't have anymore. And so the Bible says that while she's in this situation, watch me real close. The Bible says that Gehazi happens, the Bible literally says, happens to be talking to the king because the king had just asked him to tell him about some of the wonderful things that Elisha had done. And so, come, come here real quick, Russ. You be the king. So, 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 so Elijah's, 
so Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, is sitting there telling the king, oh, Elijah's done some great things. In fact, this one time, uh, Elijah uh, had this lady, and she had a son, and, and the son had fallen sick. And so I went to the house, and Elijah went to the house, and he laid on her, and he breathed on her, and, and, and the son came back to life. And as he's telling her, the Bible says, the woman walks in. The, it says it happens that she walked into the king to ask about her land at the very moment Gehazi was telling him about what Elijah had done for her. I'm going to try one more time. She has a need. Before when he asked, can I say a word to the king? She said, no, I'm good. But see, here's the thing. Seasons shift in life and things change and you never know when your situation is going to go the other way. But God is farsighted. He can see beyond you. And what you didn't need in the prior chapter, you may need in this chapter. So she's coming to try to talk to the king, but God has set that thing up that the king is already hearing about what is done it so when she comes in the bible says the king says to, to one of his servants you go with her and you tell them to give back her house and to give back her land why because she had given to god not to get she had given to god because it was the right thing to do but god said you will never beat me giving i'll give it back good measure pressed down shaken together running over it may not be financial it may be health it may be peace it may be power it may be purpose it may be influence you know we call influence in church favor and you know something about favor favor ain't fair i need about 300 folks in here that are witnesses that god has favored you in some area you're not that smart you're not that cute it's just that god's that good and when i think of the goodness of jesus and all he's done for me my soul I mean, my sanctified soul shouts out hallelujah. Come on, give one person a high five and say, neighbor, streams and windows, windows and streams, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we see drip, drop. God's got a blessing. That's exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ever ask or think according to the power. Come on, high five one more person telling windows and streams, windows and streams. Come on, stand on your feet. You're not chasing down blessings. Blessings trying to break into the house. Favor, influence is trying to break into the house when you put yourself in position. Her greatest testimony was not her wealth. Her greatest testimony was God gave her the real desire of her heart. Then God restored it. And then God gave her back what the devil took. And all month long, somebody's been turning the volume down because all you can hear is money. We stopped talking about money a long time ago. We're talking about a relationship with God that allows you to experience the fullness of the kingdom of God. Can I pray for you? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you right now that we don't have to live life on our own. We don't have to try to manage it by ourselves. But God, you have given us an instruction manual called your word. And that shows us the way to purpose and to the abundant life that you promised. God, we know that our abundance is not about, about a lot of stuff. It's about prospering in the spirit. It's about being not just able to have a nice bed, but to have a a good night's sleep in the bed because you had peace. So, Father, I pray right now that you might mature us so we'll no longer be slaves to materialism, but we'll be good stewards who leave a legacy, who are generous to your kingdom, who empower your people, 
who fulfill our calling in you. And God, I pray for anybody who doesn't know you for themselves, anyone who is unsaved or unsure. God, I pray right now that somebody might come forward to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I pray, God, right now for anybody who may be saved but doesn't have a church home where they're growing. God, help them to understand it's not enough to believe. They need to belong to the household of faith. and Give them strength and faith to walk forward. God, I believe you for the harvest even now. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. All God's children said amen.